It's going to be a, a quick one because a lot of this is still work in progress. Uh, it follows on from some work I presented here at the end of last year about a model that we're developing about the origins of the genetic code. And then just after that, uh, a paper came out uh, in Nature about changes to the genetic code that has been achieved in synthetic biology. And Dr. Frank had some good ideas about using this kind of inspiration to come up with a new idea about the very origins of the genetic code. So this presentation uh, will be based on uh, his ideas. Okay, um, I don't have time to go into the genetic code in detail, um, but the one point that we will focus on in this talk is that when we construct uh, proteins, um, what happens is that we amino acids, which are the elements out of which it's composed, and this, the sequence of these elements is specified by a sequence of triplets, and each of these triplets uh, consists of uh, four, one of four letters which uniquely uh, specify one particular amino acid. Okay, so having a certain kind of triplet sequence will live, give a certain kind of sequence of amino acids which then folds into a protein with a certain kind of function. So that's a kind of very basic uh, overview of what uh, the system is that we're dealing with here. Now, these triplets basically um, are the genetic. This is a table of all the possible triplets that we can have and what kind of amino acid they're coding for. And this is a standard genetic code table and it has been studied already uh, since, I guess, the mid of the last century, something like that, uh, for its regularities, because here's one particular regularity, the polar requirement, which is related to hydrophobicity. And we can see, for example, that uh, this column, uh, most of the amino acids share the property uh, here, whereas in other uh, areas, for example, here, they share the property here. And that's uh, good because it means that if there are some errors in translation or in the coding, so that, for example, instead of AAU, you get AAC, it doesn't really matter because you have the same amino acid, so it's a kind of error robustness mechanism. And there are many other kinds of regularities. And that basically means that for most people, the genetic code couldn't have just appeared all at once by chance. Right? There must have had been some kind of process of optimization in order to get us these kinds of regularities. Okay, so the problem here though is that if we assume that the genetic code did change over time, um, most changes turn out to be costly. Right? So we can imagine that uh, we want to increase the number of amino acids that are being specified. In this table, we are specifying 20 of them. We can imagine that in the beginning, maybe there was just around 10 being specified and then we want to increase it to 20, right? That would mean that at some points we have to change the way in which one of these codes to, for example, not being ASN anymore to be GNN, right? But that means then that all the previous gene sequences which have been encoding a certain kind of protein will now not function properly anymore because the sequences that they were depending on now code for something different, right? That's one of the problems. The other problem we can imagine is what if in the beginning we didn't have three positions in the you know, triplets coding, but what if we just had duplets, for example, and we just added an extra uh, position in order to increase the capacity of the code? Well, if we do that, we can imagine what happens when the system tries to read previous codes. Instead of now reading duplets, it will read triplets, but that means that everything will become unreadable of what had been previously coded in a duplet way. So it would basically mean that the whole system would break down. So both of these changes of increasing the capacity are costly. That's what I say here. Yeah. So different solutions have been uh, proposed to this problem, and it's one of these topics that has attracted a lot of interest. How do we deal with the fact that changes to the genetic code are costly? However, um, Dr. Front noticed there could be another possibility in which we don't have any costly changes at all, and so we have an increase in the informational capacity. And I'm just going to line out the hypothesis right here, and we're going to unpack it in more detail in the coming slides. Our hypothesis is that there was an expansion of the number of codons available for amino acid assignment via an increase in the number of nucleotides employed by the three bases of a codon from two to four, right? So I said, in the standard genetic code, we have four letters per position in the triplet. Our proposal is, if we only had two letters per position, 
originally, and then only later did we add an extra pair of letters. And this uh, recent advances in synthetic biology have demonstrated that changing the number of letters, to increase them, actually um, is not a problem. It's uh, possible to do this in the lab now. So synthetic biology has been uh, working on uh, manipulating the genetic code already for a while. They've been able to reassign, reallocate uh, amino acids and introduce new ones and so forth. But in this case, what they managed to show, Zhang and colleagues at the end of last year, was that they were able to add a third base pair to the genetic code and therefore increase the informational capacity of the genetic code to specify even more amino acids than was previously possible. And they managed to do this and integrate it into the RNA translation and so forth and create new proteins. Um, and the big advantage of their technique is that all the previously coded gene sequences remain intact. There is no cost to this increased informational capacity. You're just adding extra codons now, but the previously coded codons all stay intact. Right? That's the big thing. So, right, so now we can have a six letter genetic code that incorporates to some extent, that subsumes the previous four letter code without any problem. Now, this basically then gives us a proof of concept that we can actually change the number of letters in the genetic code. Apparently not many people, or in fact we haven't found any reference, have thought about the possibility of that during the evolution of the genetic code that there could have been changes in the number of letters that the code was using. In particular, we now have found a way, right, as a proof of concept, how we can increase the informational capacity of the genetic code without any costly changes. Right? So this has implications, we argue, for understanding and thinking about the origins of the genetic code. Because just as we now move from four to six, we hypothesized that previously it is possible that it could have gone from two to four. So a two-letter uh, code requires um, one element to bond with another. So basically, we have two options here. It could be have started as GC or AT, depending or U, depending on whether we're talking about RNA or DNA. And we basically focus on the GC bond for various reasons. Um, it has uh, three hydrogen bonds rather than two, and that gives it additional stability. And also, um, it has a very, uh, it's very robust under high temperatures, and two of the main scenarios for the origins of life that are uh, most uh, clearly developed at the moment both assume that life started in very hot environments. One of them says it happened in deep sea vents, very, very deep sea vents. The other says maybe it could have been terrestrial hot springs, but both of them would require something that would have been very resistant to hot temperatures in order to pass along genetic information. So we basically said the GC seems to be more suitable. Also, GC uh, is used in both DNA and RNA, whereas uh, T is replaced by U in the latter. That could suggest that GC was actually has a more fundamental role to play. Um, if you look at um, in coding regions and genomes, we find that those with higher gene density um, have higher GC content, and that has to do with the fact that the stop codons uh, are tend to be coded uh, using the other letters. So again, it could suggest that the GC is actually the more fundamental pair of the two. Okay, so uh, then our assumption is that originally we had a two-letter code consisting of G and C, and that code evolution happened um, by adding new codons but not by changing the assignment of previously existing codons, okay, thereby avoiding this problem of costly reassignments. We assume that this happened gradually, uh, for example, by incorporating just the first uh, one and uh, the new letters in one position of the triplet, and then two, and then in three. And we can also take into account Crick's wobble effect that the third position actually is less accurate uh, in code things than the first and the second position. So as a first pass, Oh, sorry. And uh, in terms of the triplet, I already said we uh, um, assumed that the triplet existed. We just assume a two-letter code. And part of that is because there are independent reasons for thinking that the triplet is an optimal solution uh, to the problem of a moving reading frame. Um, and this can be the case whether this third base uh, uh, make a difference to the assignments or not. And so our assumption, starting assumption is then that we had a triplet and at each letter of the triplet, each of the three positions, we could have either G or C. That gives us then this initial 
genetic code. So our proposal is that at the very beginning, the genetic code looked like this. We have the three bases of the triplet, and we can have G and C on either of the on either three of the positions. And given that we're saying we're not having any costly reassignments, we can basically go back to the original genetic code table and then read out what the amino acids would be. And in this case, it would be pro argon gly. Now, is this a reasonable assumption that these were the first amino acids in the code or not? We will, we will look at this in a bit in a moment, uh, based on the expected prebiotic abundance of these amino acids. Right? So at the very origin of life, where we didn't have yet a lot of complex metabolic networks, probably we should expect that the amino acids were used were also abundant in the environment. And amino acids that required very complicated synthetic pathways could have only emerged at a very late stage. So we can use that as a kind of indicator to double check whether the sequence of additions of amino acids that we're going to propose makes sense or not. At least you know, whether it's consistent with what we know about prebiotic abundance. Okay, ah, and one more point. Actually, we could have had eight amino acids here, right? Because we have eight possible codons. We only find four. That's actually nice because it shows that even at the very early stage, we would have had some redundancy, which would have increased error robustness for translation mistakes. So for example, here, the, the third base wobble, right? It doesn't matter whether it's C or G in the third base, both of them give you the same amino acid. So we would have had already some error robustness at the very beginning, which makes sense. Okay, how do we go from this very basic uh, code to the one that we now know as the standard genetic code? Well, we can assume uh, a kind of step-by-step -step process whereby one uh, by one the code added these new pair, the AT or AU, and thereby added the new amino acids. Okay, so we're going to look at this. Uh, we're going to look at the codons which differ from the original GZ code I just showed you in only one of the three positions, then in two of the three positions, and then in all three. Okay, um, here are the, the codons that get added to the original I just showed you, and the amino acids that they're coding for. Uh, if we change one, two, and all three. Okay, we can, this is just for overview. If you want, we can go back to this. Now, what, yes, so I'm going to get to that, yes, so the, this is the num, this number is how we're going to um, check the consistency of the stages because they tell us the probability of finding these amino acids in a prebiotic context, right? So it's a relative, a rate, a relative rate of observation in experiments and meteorites and uh, under you know, hot uh, end conditions and so on, of finding these amino acids. So if the, the smaller the number, the more likely you are to find it under pre-probiotic conditions. And if you go down to the last number here, 14.2, it means that they've never been found. We can just have a look at where we get this data from. It's from a paper by Higgs and Putrid from 2009, which did a massive review of all the literature looking at the relative concentrations of uh, amino acids that have been found under prebiotic context. And this is their overall ranking here. And here are the 20 amino acids of the genetic code. And so all of them are pretty much found until we get to these last six here, which share the last place of have never been found under prebiotic conditions. OK. So now going to these two, one, two, three stages again, if we now plot the average expected abundance of the amino acids for each of the stages, the original table I showed you is here, then if we move one uh, pair away, in one position of the three triplet, we find here, if we move two away, and D, meaning now that all of the three uh, letters are either A or U, we go here. So actually what we find is a trend towards less likely amino acids, which is what we expect. So in this sense, our proposal is consistent with the evidence that the amino acids that are, haven't been found or are less likely found in the prebiotic context, context are most likely coded by letters that are very, I mean, by codons that are very far away from the original GC code. This is nice. It gives us a first indication that we might be onto something. Now, um, what we can also do uh, is say, well, here we're just looking at, in general, the distance. So this distance of one, could happen in the first position, the second position, or the third position, 
But that's a, an unrealistic assumption because we know that these three are not equal, right? So we already know that the third one is an ambiguous one, and there is some evidence to say that the first one is the most solid one. So what we can do is actually divide now these two in a more fine grain and say, what if we then look at um, not only the distance, but also where it happens, at which position in a triplet. And now we can actually reverse the procedure and say, we're going to take the average um, probability of abundance periodically right, for each of these uh, possibilities, and then plot them in, in this kind of sequence, and then read out at the bottom what kind of evolutionary sequence does it suggest to us, and does it make any sense. This is what we have. So here again, remember that low numbers means high possibility of uh, prebiotic amino acid abundance, and this is low uh, abundance, right? So then I'm going to take you through the steps uh, that is uh, arranging here. But just one thing that we can see already, interestingly, there's no difference between these two, no difference between these two, and just a little bit of difference between these two, which suggests that maybe the evolution of the genetic code happened in three broad stages. Okay, so what are these uh, three broad stages? Let's look at phase one. In this case, we have these amino acids. Um, it includes the primordial two-letter GC code that I showed you in the very beginning, as well as those codons of the standard genetic code that differ from the two-letter code in only the third position. That's nice, right? Because that's what we expect. That third letter was always already the one that had the least weight in terms of coding for something. So this makes it a very suitable place for the introduction of new letters, right? Because basically it doesn't matter. Everything is coded such that it doesn't depend on the third position. So if we change the third position by adding new letters, basically it's a neutral change, right? There's no difference here. Okay, so these are the first two. These are the first two. Basically one of them is the original code and the other one is uh, with a uh, new letter in the third position. Now the second phase are these two. Now we are adding uh, these amino acids, right? And what happens in this case is that we introduce the uh, A or T or U in the second position and also in the second and third position. So this is again consistent with the literature because uh, many people have already argued that the relative abundance of these amino acids suggests that G was fixed uh, for a long time and actually the second base was the most important discriminator. And we again find that this is uh, true also for our proposal. So during this uh, second stage, it's likely that we had the introduction of the, you know, the extra two letters into the second position um, of the genetic code. And again, interestingly, the third position still played no coding role. So uh, that's why there's no difference here between these two. Right? One includes the third position, but it's just redundant. It makes no difference. So now for the, the last four steps here, Phase three, in the final stage of code evolution, the first position of a codon also starts to include a new, and this offers new possible combinations with the other position. This is nice because, like I said, in the literature, they already assumed that the first uh, letter probably was fixed to a G uh, for a long time. And the individual four steps that we have where we can't really discriminate them because they're very, very close, and so I think it's better to treat them as one coherent group of uh, of changes, but it basically means that now you also have the other possibilities, right? So you can have it in the first, you can have it in the first and the second, you can have it in the first and the third, right? Interestingly, also at this stage, stop codons first make their appearance, which is also expected, right? You wouldn't need stop codons perhaps at the very origin of the code, because things were simple, maybe gene sequences were short, maybe the coding was not so complex, but eventually, once you get very long sequences with lots of subdivisions between coding regions, Right? Maybe you need pop stop codons, and so indeed, when we go the furthest away from the GC code, that's when the stop codons first make their appearance, which again is what we would expect. Um, so this is with uh, trying to check the consistency with uh, uh, relative um, prebiotic abundance. Another checking the consistency of a proposal is with respect to the polar requirement. I already mentioned at the beginning the polar requirement is basically a, a measure of hydrophobicity as one kind of indicator of general chemical properties. Um, and so one uh, important point about this is that the, the genetic code is designed such that um, 
uh, we need a balance between hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids because this enhances protein folding. So we would expect that the stages through which uh, genetic code gets modified retains this balance. So what do we find, going back to the original proposal of the original GC code, one letter distance, uh, the one position distance, two positions distance, and the whole triplet being uh, just A or U's, we find that indeed the neutral pH balance is retained through these changes, which is what we would expect uh, in order not to interrupt the, the uh, effect on protein folding. So conclusions, we think that this hypothesis has merit and deserves further attention. Uh, as far as we know, nobody else has proposed this. If you know of any work on this related, please send it to us, but we've searched quite a bit, and for some reason nobody has seems to have considered this possibility yet. It's consistent with the available evidence on prebiotic amino acid abundances and parole requirement values. And the crucial advantage is that it can account for the main stages of code expansion without information loss and without costly code and reassignments. And therefore, future work should, for example, test this hypothesis by determining other uh, implications. And one of them could be that uh, whether there is um, the evolutionary age of important gene sequence correlates with their GC content, right? So that should be one thing in where we say, well, the oldest genes should be the one highest contents because they should date back to the time when, for example, the first coding happened with the original or primordial C code. And um, that's all for me. Thank you. Since Hola. Yes. In English or Spanish? Ok. Eh, está súper interesante el trabajo. Eh, dos preguntas. Una, por, o sea, yo que no sé nada de genética, ¿por qué hay esto? O sea, ¿por qué se encuentra que en esta segunda etapa el primer, eh, el primero de, la primera posición tenía que estar como fijada? Y la segunda pregunta es, bueno, y ahora que ya se puede hacer esta extensión a seis si se han encontrado patrones similares en nuestras, en nuestras en las cadenas modernas de aminoácidos. Can I respond uh, in English? So, the part of your question about why the first one is G. So, we didn't actually fix it. I'm just, it's something that came out of the analysis and we can understand it in the context that was previously written in the literature. It's just that when we um, group all the amino acids with particular types of codons, right? So let's say those that have GC contents only in the first and the second position of the triplet, but not in the third. Those that have GC content only in the second position, but not in the first and the third. So you can do that for all positions, right? And then it tells you from the standard genetic code for each of these groups of codons, what amino acids are they specifying? Then we took those groups of amino acids and took the relative probability of them being Know, uh, how early they were present in a prebiotic line, how likely they were present. And then we ordered them according to likelihood and looked at what stages of additions of codons do we find. And in that sequence, the G is one that stays fixed for a long time. And that's just consistent with what other people have been suggesting. But it's not something that we put in, in there from the start. It just came out of the analysis. And the second part about extending to six, what was the question again? Eh, que si había como algún tipo de patrón justo de que eh, si cuando se añadían estos nuevas dos letras se encontraban estos no because it, this, in this case it was just them uh, engineering it right so and they didn't in, add a, a lot of new amino acids they just added a few just to make a, show that it's possible to do it but they didn't exhaust all of the possibilities Hello, thank you. Very nice work. Um, <clears throat> if I understand correctly, you're, you have a su you're suggesting that there was a, a, a life form, a primor primordial life form, that it was based on short DNA sequences that only had Gs and Cs, right? Correct. And, but everything else was the same. The tRNAs, transfer RNAs would have been the same for the codon assignments and, and, and all of that. Yes. Um, 
do I mean so we could go and test how such life forms uh, existed right what what is the biochemistry not not the life forms themselves but how would DNA behave in those circumstances and so okay. forth I had a, a you know a second question though so the other thing you're also assuming a prebiotic chemistry for your probabilities mm -hmm. but if you already had this life form this primordial life form you wouldn't really be having prebiotic uh, um, co context, right? So you might be having a, a and if you thought about that. At yes, all. that's a good point. So uh, we could look at the, how, at the different pathways to getting the different amino acids and what are their requirements and then look at that a little bit more detail. Um, and about the, the very first life form, Yes, so it's a bit strange uh, because we're not used to thinking about it in terms of something having just very short sequences only of a few letters. Um, but in, in the paper that we're writing, uh, we do cite some at least, you know, suggestive evidence that there are some organisms that have very chopped up uh, genomes where they're just floating bits around. And for some reason, they manage to combine them and create proteins. So at least it's not impossible in principle to have something like that. And there are some other papers that have shown that even very short snippets of RNA can have adaptive functions in the cell cycle. For example, by, I don't know, equilibrating pressures of uh, different kind of concentrations and so on. I'm not a biochemist, so it's like something a bit hard for me to get into it. But uh, it seems like uh, even very short sequences can have both adaptive roles in the kind of metabolic cycles of the cells, plus they can have the coding role even in modern organisms where we don't need stop codons and things like that in order to get it to work. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, we cannot, of course, think that uh, the genetic codons, you know, uh, spontaneously came about, and that's it. There must have been a way to Transmit information. This uh, has been thought of polymers, other things that simply reproduce. So you to call it life form, perhaps it's stretching it a little bit. Uh, however, uh, we must, uh, I want to stress, maybe not correctly, that there, there must have been a path towards, towards uh, the creation of, of our. Uh, genetic code, and uh, in fact, I, I have been involved in looking for that for a long time using very different procedures. What I want to stress again is that the fact that a few months ago these people managed to introduce two new codons into into, into two letters, uh, uh, yes, letters into the codons uh, gave us the idea that. That doesn't destroy at all the, all previous energy, uh, information. And that's the, the basic point. Because all other ways, like stressing, uh, uh, make you lose the, all previous information. If you change the number of, of positions or the number in the codon, a two letter codon, <coughs> then you lose information. Uh, so that made us think back. Okay, if we, we are now uh, changing life by increasing two letters. And these organisms live, are able to live, and they are starting to generate new proteins. And so we can go back in time, and that's the basic idea. It must have been that this system of, of, of information communication was done with this idea of going back to two. So it's simply a, a generalization of the idea to go back. It's because of the, of the symmetry. So it's really a binary code, but each side of the DNA has a mirror image of the other one. So when you go from four to two, no, no, no. You can go to, it's like you kind of go to one symbol. Yeah. 
no, you no, have this to be is able a to. DNA, so I mean, honestly, still two. It's a zero and one. Okay. Uh, my question is related to the fact that you are focusing a lot on information and um, the um, considerations of a physical chemical point of view, uh, entropy, entropy, uh, cost of making linkages. Uh, you, you haven't talked about that. So uh, my question is, is the GNC, as you were mentioning, uh, they are the strong bases, the ones that have three hydrogen bonding when you look at the complementary base. And uh, the A and T are the, the ones that are the weak bases. Have you looked, have you made any contact with the physical chemical aspects of the problem? We first started thinking about so which out of the two possibilities should we go for, GC or AU. Um, we actually thought maybe it would have been an advantage to have uh, AU because it only has two hydrogen bonds and th that actually is more cost uh, efficient, right? It is need less energy to create those bonds. So, but from the other point of view, it gives you less stability, right? So we, we did think about that a little bit. But if you have any specific comments of why we shouldn't think that GC is the one I'd be interested to hear it. Well, we can talk later. Uh, I'm not against anything of what you said, but it's interesting to talk about. Yeah. Okay, thank you. One last question. <clears throat> I, well, the genetic code it makes sense because it is the the dictionary to translate between amino acids into proteins, right? But it also has the information of the very same proteins that construct the machinery to make this translation. So without, without those proteins or without those amino acids that are needed for, for the translation to occur, the genetic code would have any sense. Have you checked that with G and C only, you still have the proteins necessary to make the translation from uh, amino acids into Thanks. It's a very good suggestion, actually, and it goes to the to the last point on in the conclusion that we should look for these ancient coding regions, Oops. Um, right? Because maybe you're right. Maybe we should look for the one of the translational machinery as one st possible starting point. We should find that they have a pr disproportionately high amount of GC content, for example. The other thing I could ask to you is that. We didn't talk about this at all today, but the last model presented was precisely an attempt to get around the problem of chicken and egg of having a translation machinery that codes for its own translational machinery by showing that the properties of the genetic code could be derived through other kinds of processes that don't depend on having such a complex machinery in the first place. That's another kind of route, but you're right. Um, the first step perhaps would be to actually look at the GC content of those regions that code for the components of the translation machinery. That's a good suggestion. We thank them again. Thank you very much. <laughs>